and now to Iran. The country has been criticised by the UN for what it calls the disturbing human rights situation in the country. Well, the author of that report is Dr Ahmad Shahid, the UN Special Rapporteur in Iran. And Dr Shahid joins me now in studio. Dr Shahid, thanks very much indeed for coming in um, this morning. We're going to be speaking about that report in just a few moments. But first, in the past hour, the UN Nuclear Agency boss said talks must proceed with a sense of urgency. Iran is of huge strategic importance. So where do the country's nuclear ambitions now stand? Paul O'Flynn has this report. The hustle and bustle of downtown Tehran. It could be any city in the world. But get in closer and you can see why this is a place that divides the world's opinion. Depending on your point of view, it's a former great power, culturally rich and fiercely proud, striving to regain its place in the world. For others, though, it's a centre of terror, a repressor of human rights intent on destabilising the region and getting its hands on nuclear weapons. Either way, it's a potential global flashpoint. Iran is a critical country geopolitically, at the heart of the Middle East. Its leaders see the nation as a regional power and have ambitions for greater global influence. It's a strong backer of Bashar al-Assad's regime in the conflict in Syria, and its support for armed groups such as Hamas and Hezbollah has created hostility with Israel and the US. And wars in Afghanistan and Iraq have further destabilised the region. The main problem of Iran is what is called its strategical loneliness. Iran has no allies in the region. His soft power is weakening every day. So we have to, to, to enlarge the picture and see the context. So I, I don't know what will happen. It depends on how the civil war in Syria will go on. It depends on what will happen in, in Egypt. It depends of, on what Israel will do, because Israel, of course, is the, the, you know, is the country, is the more, most threatening country maybe to, to Iran. Iran is becoming a pariah state. Trade sanctions have crippled the economy of the huge oil producer. The UN has said the human rights situation in the country is disturbing, with allegations of torture and detention of those who oppose the regime. Its critics accuse the country of supporting terrorism. We don't have to think about Iran in terms of an unstable country. Iran is a stable regime. The regime still has a lot of resources in terms of control and in terms of uh, institutional resources. So the issue of human rights is, of course, an issue that has to be uh, on the agenda of the nuclear negotiator that, in my opinion, and has to be on the agenda of the, uh, of the international politicians and policymakers more generally. But it is Iran's nuclear program that most unsettles its neighbours. President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad has repeatedly denied allegations that Iran is pursuing nuclear weapons, saying it only wants nuclear energy. A recent UN report said Iran was installing advanced centrifuges that would allow it to speed up its nuclear program. Iran's non-compliance with international nuclear treaties has led to sanctions. World powers ended talks with Iran last week with no sign of a breakthrough. They will meet again next month. The US said a serious engagement by Iran could lead to a longer-term comprehensive agreement. Iran that has a remarkable history. The Iranian people, uh, you know, there are many Iranian Americans today who contribute to our society. Uh, we would like to move to uh, a better relationship and it begins by resolving uh, this nuclear issue. But it is not clear if this is the outcome that Iran desires. The tension within the country has now turned to domestic matters and a crucial presidential election in June. The outcome will have a huge impact on the future direction of the country and the Middle East. The rest of the world will keep a close watch. And that was Paula Flynn reporting. Well, I'm joined now by uh, Dr. Ahmad Shahid. Thank you very much indeed for coming in. I mean, obviously, it's a hugely complex geopolitical issue, what's going on in Iran at the moment. Your special responsibility, though, is the human rights abuses happening in Iran. Uh, your most recent report there highlighted quite a, a few quite startling human rights abuses, really. I mean, what is the situation there at the moment? Well, I began monitoring Iran for the UN two years ago, and I have noticed a sharp deterioration of human rights situation in the country. 
and leading up to elections, I'm very concerned about the erosion of space for, for political expression, the erosion of space for media freedom, as well as continuing other human rights uh, alleged violations, including high rate of executions, uh, poor due process rights, discrimination uh, on the grounds of gender, ethnicity and, re and re religion, as well as a uh, question of human rights defenders, uh, who many of whom face varying degrees of, uh, of alleged persecution. Yeah, there's one particular person, Abdul Fattah Sultani, a lawyer whose crime, it appears, was to cooperate with an NGO and get an international human rights award. Well, his case is actually, uh, you know, uh, symbolizes a lot of the difficulties human rights defenders face uh, in, in Iran. Uh, in addition to journalists who are targeted, who are alleged to be targeted for speaking out on issues in Iran, those who defend uh, people who are accused of human rights uh, 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 viol violations also in, end up fa facing charges. So if you, most of the prominent lawyers in Iran uh, presently are facing either charges or are in detention, and human rights defenders are, uh, in particular are targeted for their work in promoting human rights standards. So Mr. Sultani is a prominent uh, lawyer. Um, um, his, uh, the allegation against him is receiving international prize for his work as a human rights defender. And that's that uh, and similar sorts of recognition is seen with suspicion by, by, by the government. And this creates a lot of uh, uh, problems for people who sta speak out and stand up for human rights violations in the country. And he's currently in detention on this crime yes, of receiving is, yes. an award. Yes. How long has he been there? How long is he likely well, to be there? Uh, well, um, uh, I think his, um, his sentence is some, some 20 years, either in prison or, dis or barred from practice. So um, some, sometimes you get a short prison sentence accompanied by a long uh, uh, sentence in terms of prohibition from practice. So uh, it's going to be long term for him. And can I ask you, I mean, obviously, from an international point of view, it's the nuclear situation in Iran that is most worrying and most engaging for, for foreign governments. Are they concerned by the human rights abuses in Iran? Like when you go back to the UN, do you feel that the international community really care about this kind of stuff? Well, I think uh, although you don't get much news headlines on it, what, what's happening in Iran and human rights situation, I think member countries in the UN are concerned. That's why, in fact, they have asked me to report to the Council and to the General Assembly uh, uh, each year. And uh, uh, in the debates in the Council, countries do take note of the, of the violations and take Iran to task on a number of these issues. Iran itself takes these reports quite seriously, as you can see from the responses uh, they have made to this, although they could do better by engaging with UN mechanisms rather than, in the, uh, rather than if they're like, trashing the reports. As, yeah, as they, they said out. it's politicized, it's fabricated, that you, you only spoke to the opposition, anti-revolution forces living abroad. But they, as you say, they do care, but they don't do anything in response, do they? Well, no. Well, I'm the fourth rapporteur in Iran for the past uh, 25 five years, and the treatment rapporteurs get from Iran has been, uh, been similar. So they go through a phase in which you know, the reports are trashed as being illegitimate. And then, of course, there comes a phase in which they try to perhaps block uh, the, the, the mandate. But in the end, they do things to, to, to respond uh, to some delegations that, that, that are made, but not in a meaningful sense. That's why the mandate co co continues. But I am gratified by the fact that in the debates, in the votes, in the Joint Assembly and in the Council, the number of countries who, now, who now speak out on uh, their concerns on Iran is increasing. Yeah, you're not allowed back into Iran. Iran won't let you in at the moment. No, uh, uh, they haven't uh, let me into the country. Uh, so it's difficult enough to, to cover it, I presume. Uh, well, there are ways of going, going around it. I have been able to speak to some 160 uh, individuals for my current report. A large number of them are people in Iran. Uh, modern technology allows me to communicate with people inside the country. And I may not be able to speak to them if I were in the country. So th there are merits of going into the country, certainly. But there are also ways to working on the mandate without going to the okay. country. Okay. And briefly, can I ask you, why are you here in Ireland? Well, I'm with invitation of frontline de de defenders. One of my purposes, of course, is to speak to human about human rights defender situation in Iran. Also, because Ireland is a member of the Human Rights Council, uh, to speak to the government uh, here, as I do to other governments also, about my concerns about alleged human rights violations in Iran. Okay. And the EU presidency, I suppose, is that something yes, that's, that's somewhere Ireland could use influence on yes, this indeed. issue? Indeed, I am going to present my report to the Council next Monday and I, I'm, I'm very keen to be able to speak to the Irish authorities before I do the presentation here in Dublin. Okay, well listen, Dr. Sheed, thank you very much indeed for coming out this morning.